Ian Treveranis will talk about advanced software features for the LA950. Um, if you have questions, you can go ahead and type them in the chat box during the webinar and we'll save them up for later on. Okay, Ian, the screen is yours. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. As you were saying, my name is Ian Trevoranis. I'm the product line manager for Haribus Particle Products. So as a broad overview, I'm going to cover measurement tools, software functions that will be used to capture a measurement, different functions that will be used to analyze the data afterwards, usually uh, for the, the quality of the data or making sure that it's as accurate or uh, uh, as correct as you like, and then data verification tools. And what that really means is if you have a specification set up for a certain product, are you hitting that specification? If you have um, a certain internal goal, if not a specification for how good the precision should be between measurements, between multiple measurements, there's also a function for that. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please send them in. We'll, uh, we'll address them either during the presentation or at the end of it. So different tools to acquire measurements, uh, probably the most important one uh, fits into the category of one button measurement. So there's a big drive in our industry to make the acquisition of a particle size result as easy and painless as possible. And the LA950 in particular has two different features that produce one button measurement capability. The first one is called the navigator. And here we see it uh, circled. So if we were in the LA950 software, we would see a little tab that said LA Navigator. And the uh, LA Navigator is kind of like a, uh, a little programming tool. It's, it's not nearly as complex as that. But you just put commands in, and it creates a little uh, linear program, and that operates the instrument. The other feature is the method expert. And the method expert is a guided, automated uh, method development tool. So at the end of it, if you go through the whole thing, you'll end up with this one button capability where you would just pull up some sequence file in the navigator list and click start. So instead of having to manually put commands in there, the method expert makes that a little bit more automated. And this is the method expert icon in the 950 software, a little signpost. So we'll talk about the method expert first. There's a whole webinar on this, and uh, I won't spend over much time on it, not as much as it probably deserves. So if you are more interested in this, either drop us a line and we can talk about it or go take a look at the webinar TE004. That's only on the method expert. But the whole goal of it was, uh, again, to create some guide for the method development process so that uh, all of our collective knowledge here at Hariba could kind of be put into the software uh, to a certain extent and so that you would have access to it without having to be on the phone with us or communicating via email or having us face to face. And the point of it is that it optimizes various parameters. So you take a measurement, you uh, try to understand what the point of the various parameter is, you know, why would you turn up the circulation speed, why would you change refractive index, take a measurement, try different uh, values for that parameter, and then evaluate which the best one was. Probably the most popular and the most useful part of the method expert is the ability to choose the best possible refractive index. So there's ways of optimizing the real and the imaginary part of the refractive index. I'll get into that in a little bit more detail later in the presentation. And then again, at the end of it, you get this one button SOP functionality. So the way the method expert is organized, it's in three sections. There's a section that deals with hardware optimization, because the LA950 unit as a whole, any particle size instrument as a whole, really all it does is it collects raw data. In the 950's case, it's scattered light data. And then we take that and we put it into a software algorithm, and the software is actually what translates that scattered light information into a particle size distribution. So the software optimization really only has to do with the refractive index. And we want to optimize both to maximize the total quality of the data. And the, uh, the third section of the method expert has to do with automation. So once you've gone through the various tests, chosen the optimized circulation speed, the optimized refractive index, and so on and so forth, uh, if you've done those tests, the values are automatically put into the automation wizard. Otherwise, you can select whatever value you like, and at the end of it, you get the one-button SOP. So again, you'd access the LA950 method expert through this little signpost. And I should say, too, that the method expert was first made part of the 950 software in version 7. Uh, so you need version 7 and beyond to have access to the method expert. 
If you're running older versions of the software, significantly older, you may also need a firmware upgrade to be uh, version 7 compliant. Uh, if you're interested at all in this, just drop us a line. We'll have plenty of contact information at the end, and we can see what we need to do. Once you click this button, you get the splash page that introduces you to everything the method expert can do. So the, the measurement wizard or the hardware optimization that I talked about, circulation speed, etc. Calculation wizard and automation wizard. So you don't have to go through all these things linearly. You can jump to a specific section. So the measurement optimization, or the hardware optimization, there's four tests in that. There's choosing the best circulation pump speed, choosing the optimal concentration of particles, uh, dispersion, which is really all about ultrasound, and then how long does the measurement last. And this is probably the least critical, I would say, unless you're measuring very wide distributions, or distributions where it has only a handful of very large particles where you may want to extend the measurement length. Uh, actually, let me go back to the last slide and expound on these a little bit more. So the circulation speed is important if you're measuring uh, very large or very dense particles. You may need to circulate faster. Uh, if you're measuring something that is kind of a fragile emulsion, let's say, and you don't want to necessarily shock the emulsion, you may choose to circulate at a very low speed. Concentration is very important. We'll get to the uh, uh, a similar function called auto-dilution that controls concentration in just a few minutes. But the idea uh, behind this is you want to make sure that you have enough sample in the analyzer, enough particles in the analyzer, that you have a good signal-to-noise ratio so you can get sufficient light scattering, but not so many particles that you engage in what's called multiple scattering. That's where the light strikes multiple particles on its way through the measurement zone. And that's bad because every time the light strikes the particle, the angle it scatters at increases, it gets wider, and the algorithm, the mean scattering theory, interprets that to be smaller particles. So multiple scattering will make you think that you have smaller particles than you actually do. Ultrasound is what we would use to help disperse the particles, and you can control either the power of the ultrasound or the length. Uh, actually, you can control both. Typically, we peg the ultrasound at its most powerful, and then we adjust the length that it's applied. we move on to the calculation optimization, that really just deals with refractive index. And refractive index, uh, if you're not familiar with it, actually comes in two components. There's the real refractive index, which if you go to the CRC handbook, that's what's going to be published for everything. So that's how we know that uh, uh, titanium dioxide has this particular uh, refractive index. And then there's the imaginary refractive index. And the imaginary really tries to handle all the ways in which we don't have ideal light scattering. So the ideal particle scatters uh, entirely through diffraction off the edge of the particle or refraction through the particle. Uh, Non-ideal scattering would include absorbing the light or reflecting the light. Uh, and so that's what the imaginary component tries to counteract. If you have a perfectly opaque particle, it should have a non-zero imaginary component because so much of that light is going to be absorbed. And so what the method expert really tries to do for each test is it tries to explain why the test is important. You know, again, why does, why does one care about what circulation speed you run at? It will describe what the test will actually do. It will show you how the results are going to be displayed. And then it will give you some advice as to choosing the best value. And the way you would run the test is the user would select up to five values. We'll see a screenshot of this a little bit later on. Uh, so again, this is what a typical method expert result would look like, and I'll talk a little bit more about the refractive index function uh, in a minute or so, but uh, this is really why people like it. So instead of having to manually recalculate the same result with three different refractive indices or four or five different refractive indices, you can have the method expert completely automate that. So not only do you get the overlay of the three or four or five different results, you also get to see how it affects the D10, D50, and D90, and you also get to see how it affects our goodness of fit measure, which we call the R parameter. More on that in a minute. So the third section of the method expert is called the automation wizard. And the automation wizard really could be used in conjunction with the previous two sections. So uh, when you get into the preparation section, you know, if you're talking about how fast you want to uh, 
the circulation pump to move. If you've already gone through that test, it will remember the value you chose and it will already populate that value. Or you can just manually select whichever you like. But as you move through this, at the end, the last screen you'll get to would be where you decide what you want your sequence file name to be. And the sequence file, again, is what the LA950 uh, uses to generate this automatic instrument operation, this one button SOP. So the automation wizard's really nice. It can be used as a standalone part of the method expert where you can just very quickly generate uh, sequence files that will automate the instrument. Uh, and I'll make a special note here too to say that uh, the method expert is currently good for wet measurements only. We don't have it ported over to the dry, uh, which uh, dry measurements are made possible by the powder jet accessory we see here sitting on top of the LA950. Uh, and we wouldn't really use the navigator function either for dry. Instead, what we would do is uh, we'd use the auto measurement button. And that really encompasses every possible use scenario for a dry measurement. And earlier this year, I went over how you could optimize dry powder measurements, and I went through the auto measurement function. So if you're interested in this, uh, go to our website, go to the Download Center, and in the webinars area, look for TE016. It's called Optimizing Dry Powder Measurements, and there's all the information you'd ever want to know in that webinar. So that was the method expert. Now if we're talking about the navigator function, uh, as I said earlier, it, uh, it creates little sequence programs to operate the LA950. And what we like about the Navigator is that it offers us a lot of flexibility. So the Method Expert uh, kind of, it's designed to make quick and easy sequence files. So it doesn't give you all the flexibility you, wouldn't, you would normally want. So if you want a specific message to appear to the operator with specific text, the Method Expert want, it doesn't have the ability to, to uh, kind of record that information. So if you did have this kind of uh, customization that you wanted, then you'd want to use the Navigator because uh, you could do basically anything you want with that. So this is one of those areas where um, I don't really want to show screenshots. So let me switch over to the 950 software, and I'm just going to verify real quickly that good. So you all should be able to see my 950 software right now. And if I've done my job, there's no identifying information for any of these samples. Uh, so what I'm going to do then is I will show you, you would go to this navigator menu here up at the top, and uh, you choose edit sequence. And so this is going to start us off with a clean slate. So uh, yeah, it's showing you the back of the slide here, but uh, the navigator function is right here. So we would want to start off and we'd say something like add new sequence, and we'd give it a name. So if all I wanted to do is create a measurement loop that took three measurements in a row, I would give that sequence name. And we have different commands that are uh, organized into three different groups. So we have common commands, and this is where you would put personalized messages to the operator. We could have it uh, wait a certain number of seconds. So let's say um, you just filled the analyzer up with some liquid and you turn the circulation pump on. A lot of times people will intuitively you know, give the instrument 30 seconds to, to make sure that all the air that might have been entrained in that liquid is allowed to, uh, to bubble up. Uh, it's also where you can put uh, an export command and a print commands and various other things. Uh, the LA wet measurement command grouping is, is essentially what you'd find in the manual measurement screen, so how to turn on the circulation pump. So we could put that command in here. And if I double left click on the circulation command, it pops open uh, just a little window that tells me, uh, gives me the option rather of, of what speed I want it to be turned on. Do I want it to be on? Do I want it to be off? Do I want it to be running at a specific speed? Or do I want it to run at whatever the current setting is on the measurement screen? So you have all these different pieces of flexibility. And then the last grouping are the wizard commands. And the wizard commands are, they give the operator a little bit more flexibility. So the uh, the LA wet measurement command list basically allows you to uh, set the various values for the operator. So you hard code in kind of what the circulation pump speed would be. You hard code in how many rinses you want. The wizard navigator uh, presents that option to the operator. So they get to choose how many times they want to rinse. They get to choose how many times uh, to measure, things like that. 
But uh, let's say if all I wanted to do was just create a quick little three times measurement, I would locate the measurement command. And anytime I locate a command, I just have to drag it over. And it loads it right into the tree. So you see what I mean? You're kind of building a program. So each of these commands happens uh, linearly once you click the Start button. And so it would uh, start the circulation pump. You know, ideally, if we're starting from scratch, we would want a feed command in there. And that would fill the analyzer up with water. And then we'd want to turn on the circulation pump. All the things you would normally do in a manual measurement, but this is just automating them. And at the end, we'd get a measurement. And, you know, we could um, put a, a drain command in here as well. Right? So you get your measurement, and then you drain the material. Uh, and, and then if we wanted to loop this, because, again, we want to do three three measurements in a row, I could double left click on the sequence here at the top and just click loop enable three times. And now what that's going to do is it's just going to run through all the commands in here three times. I'd save this. I probably already have something similar saved. Click OK. Return to the Turn to the LA950 software. Let me just make sure that you guys are on the same screen I am. Good. And then I'd look for it in the LA Navigator tab in the list of sequence files. So there it is. Measure three times. So this is the sequence program I just created. And now if I were hooked up to the analyzer, I'd click the Start button, and we'd proceed through. So it, it's not as simple as the method expert, because the method expert, again, kind of restricts your values, and it gets you kind of on a, on a rail, so to speak. You're moving station to station. Um, but it is very flexible. It's still very easy to use. It's certainly not uh, like it used to be, where you'd have to create you know, almost like little basic code programs, uh, but still very easy. So that's the navigator. And I'll skip through the rest of these slides. That's really more useful for people that are downloading the slide set from the website. And so we'll get to another tool that allows us to take better measurements called the automatic dilution function. So let me get my little arrow pointer back. So the auto dilution function we'd see on the measurement screen for the LA950. So uh, most people are going to be using the feed alignment blank buttons over here. Maybe the rinse button over on the right side, but uh, auto dilution is actually a very nice function. And what it does is it's, it gives us concentration control. Every time we push that button, it's going to look at some some setup material that uh, is actually on the next slide. It's going to say, "All right, I'm currently at a transmittance percentage on my red light of 66 percent, which is very concentrated." And the condition file tells me I want it to be between 90 and 80 percent, so I have too much sample in the instrument. So what it's going to do, the 950, is it's going to automatically add some more dispersant. It's going to take you know, whatever it is, probably water. It's going to fill it into the analyzer, and then it's going to drain a little bit. So essentially, you're diluting it, and then you're draining it, and then you may, it'll do a quick little concentration check again. So, all right, from 66%, I went up to 73%. Still not in the 90 to 80% range that I need to be in, so I'm going to repeat the process. Uh, it's very nice. It's very automatic. Uh, it will occasionally entrain a little bit of air in the uh, analyzer, so you may want to do a, uh, a debubble after it. You may want to start and stop the circulation pump immediately after. Uh, and then the last point I'll make is that this function is not possible without a fill pump. So this is one of the advantages of every single LA950 having this fill pump. Uh, and I should also say for those of you that have the Miniflow accessory out there, the auto dilution function is also available with the Miniflow because it also has an integrated fill pump. So this then in the condition file, in the measurement area of the condition file, is where you would set up how the auto dilution control works. So it asks you in this area what you want these little green bar guides to be for the red laser and the blue LED. And depending on which light you tell the auto dilution function to look at, if it's red or blue, it will see am I within these green bars. And uh, that's how it works. All right, so those were the major tools uh, that you may not know about in the LA950 to help you acquire better measurements. Now we'll take a quick look at some data analysis tools. And uh, as I said earlier, the first and foremost of that is, is really refractive index. We probably get more questions about refractive index than anything else to do with laser diffraction. Uh, and because of that, we have so many resources on our website, and I would really encourage you, if you have any kind of uh, 
question in your mind about refractive index or you don't have peace of mind about refractive index, uh, take a look at the website. Definitely contact us. There's, there's really no question we've, we've never been able to answer. Is that a good English sentence? There's, we've never gotten a question we couldn't answer. Uh, and specifically, we had a webinar on, we have a few webinars about refractive index, but the latest one is about the optimization of refractive index. You'd find that on our website under code TR009. So many of you, I'm guessing, probably manually change your refractive index. So uh, not, not a, this isn't something that really worries people that are working with very, very well characterized materials. So, you know, if we're talking titanium dioxide, choosing the refractive index is, is kind of trivial because titanium dioxide has a very well-known refractive index. If you're working with silica, the same thing applies. If, however, you're formulating some new compound or you have a, um, you know, some, some composite material that uh, you, you're not exactly sure what the refractive index will be because it's a core shell type material or it's um, uh, anything like that, what you would probably do is you would create new refractive index kernels. That's uh, what we call them in the LA950. Specifying the refractive index of the sample, specifying the imaginary component, again, of the sample, and then of also the dispersant. So if it's uh, dispersed in water, you'd need to give the refractive index of water. If it's dispersed in isopropanol, you give the IPA refractive index. So you'd create these things manually. You'd click the Create button. You probably would sit and wait the 45 to 60 seconds for the software to create the kernel. And then you'd click this Recalc button at the bottom, and that would change the distribution somewhat. Uh, and, you know, if you got more advanced than that, you'd say, all right, I don't... I don't really know what the refractive index should be, and I don't have any other identifying characteristics. You know, I, uh, it's a novel material. It's you know maybe semi-opaque, so having a high imaginary component uh, it doesn't make sense because it's not going to be absorbing that much light. Uh, and having a very low imaginary component doesn't make much sense because it's going to be absorbing some light. So with no other guiding intelligence whatsoever, we would recommend and we have been recommending for years that you look at something we call the R parameter. And the R parameter is really just a goodness of fit metric. So what the actual scattered light data is compared to the back calculated theoretical expectation from the distribution that is on the screen right now. So that's a relatively complex way of saying, you know, how closely does the actual measure the theoretical, uh, match with the theoretical. So minimizing the R parameters is one way to say I am using a better refractive index because as that gets smaller and smaller, the fit between the actual and the theoretical gets better. So we see here in this example that the R parameter of 1.49 is lower than the R parameter of 1.86, and we can kind of see that graphically backed up too, right? This is not as good a fit as this is. And I would stress that we only really want to use the R parameter when we had no other information to go on. It can be misleading sometimes. You know, there's, uh, if we were to graph our parameter versus every possible refractive index po possibility, we would see all sorts of local minima and maxima, where, you know, we may find a local minima for uh, a refractive index combination that just it doesn't, it doesn't have any basis in reality. So we only really want to use this in the absence of any other information. But this is kind of a, tedious manual process, right? You might be creating six or seven different refractive index kernels using the intensity graph, which I'll talk a little bit about later, to look at this R parameter value and just it could be very, very manual. So the method expert, we automate this. Uh, and this is what it would look like if we were doing the real part optimization. We would choose which data file we want to run it on, either something from uh, something that's been measured in the past or something that was just measured. Choose the RI for the liquid. Uh, set the imaginary component, because what we want to do is optimize the real component, and then enter up to five real values. Once you click the Execute Test Sequence button, it's going to create those five refractive index kernels if they don't already exist. And then it's going to give you, again, uh, a display of, of what those different values do to the distribution, to the D10, D50, D90, and to the R parameter. And uh, all the information you would need to make a good choice is actually in this little light bulb button. So this is where our expert advice 
is located, you click this and it would pop open a new window. And it would tell you why we care about the R parameter, what it does, and why we want it to be minimized. So in this case, we would probably choose the real value of 1.50, because even though it's not affecting the distribution very much, or the D10, D15, D90, it does minimize the R parameter. Uh, so even though the distribution is fairly close, again, if, if the particle size police knocked on your door, and they asked you why you chose this refractive index value, you could always say uh, a 1.50 gave me the lowest R parameter. And here we would choose that value. And then once we click Next, it gets saved in the method expert to be put in the SOP at the end. Uh, we can do the exact same thing with the imaginary. I'm not going to go through all the steps, except that we fix the real this time and put up to five imaginary values. And the results look essentially the same. You have the overlay of the distributions, D10, D50, D90, and then the R parameter. In this case, we would choose the second I term. Again, if it has some basis in reality, because it's minimizing the R parameter. Uh, so just as really more of a reference slide, uh, what is the R parameter? It's, it's this equation. That's how we calculate it. And there's also another error calculation in the 950 called the chi-square. And the chi-square is different than the R parameter in a few ways, the most important of which is that it incorporates the standard deviation of the scattered light intensity for the measurement. So a typical LA950 measurement, let's say, takes 5,000 scans, and that happens in the space of about a second. Those 5,000 scans each have yeah, 87 detectors worth of light intensity values. And so the standard uh, deviation of those light intensities, you know, if it's fluctuating quite a bit, then the chi-square value will increase because the standard deviation goes up. If the standard devi uh, the, uh, if you have not very much fluctuation, then the chi-square value goes down. Uh, pragmatically, how this works is if you have a very high chi-square value than you're used to for a specific material, that could be an indication that you're, there's something going on with your material. Maybe the pH balance fell off uh, or the pH balance is off, in which case your material might be aggregating or coalescing. Or it could be an indicator that you forgot to turn on the circulation pump and your material is settling out over time. Okay. Uh, we should move on to the multimodal reports. And this is actually one of the very most useful functions in the 950 software. And really what it's getting at is many of you will have samples that look something like this, where it's a, a bimode or a trimode or even more than that. And there really is a trap in looking at the D10, D50, D90, or the mean, or, or any other full distribution metric to describe multimodal resor results. Because as we see here, the D10, D50, and D90 reported for this really don't match up with anything in particular. Are they really giving you an idea of what the largest particles are? Are they really giving you an idea of what the smallest particles are? Not, not so much. They're, they're less meaningful than if we found a way to split the distribution up into its component parts. And so that's where the multimodal report comes in. We'd find it in the advanced function software menu. And we choose multimodal report. And let me switch back to the 950 software real quick. We see the exact same data file up on my screen. Let me make sure that you guys, OK, good, you're on the screen with me. Again, we'd go to the advanced function menu, choose multimodal report, and it'll run the report. And we can set it up in different ways. Um, but usually, the default setup is the best setup. So allowing the software to choose where you want the split point to be, where it wants to decide that one mode ends and the other begins, uh, is, is usually the best, most accurate way. Uh, so many of you might have experience with an older version of the multimodal report. So it looked a little bit different in the past versions of the 950 software. And the reason we moved to this new one is that the old one, if you had a distribution that looked like this blue curve here, let me see if I can make that a little bit more. Let's see if I can make that stand out a little bit more. There. So if you had a distribution that looked like this blue curve, the old multimodal report would just look for the minimum spot in it and just divide it right there. So it would be like having a particle size distribution that went to the minimum and then just dropped to zero. And that's not realistic. What is realistic is to deconvolute the distribution, the two modes, and say, 
all right, realistically, if I had two separate materials and I mixed them together, uh, to get this multimodal result, what would the distributions of the two individual components be? So that's what the new multimodal report does. This was introduced in version 6 of the software. So if you're using uh, earlier than version 6, you'll have the old report. Later than version 6, you'll have the new one. And this really is a little bit more accurate. And in general, why we want the multimodal report is because it gives us individual statistics on each mode. So now we get to see the D10, D50, and D90 for the finest peak, and the D10, D50, D90, etc. for the larger peak. So it just gives us a better handle on what's actually happening. And we can print the result. We can uh, save it to a text file. We can do all sorts of different things. We can calculate the D80, the percent at uh, 2 microns, all the things that you'd normally be able to do with the 950 software. So let me switch back to the PowerPoint. Good. And again, I'll skip through these slides. So the multimodal report is really easy to use. It's very intuitive and uh, very worthwhile for anyone with a multimodal distribution. Now I'm going to talk about the intensity graph. The intensity graph uh, is probably the most interesting function to me in the 950 software, but I have different, different needs and different uses than most 950 users. It's interesting to me because it actually allows you to look at the raw scattering data. And uh, this is a good point to remind you that really what the 950 does, right, is it's just a piece of hardware that generates some scattering information off of a particle. And all it's really collecting is the intensity, which is here on the y-axis, over various angles at which we have detectors set up. And that's all the hardware really does. Is it just collects angle and intensity of scattered light. And then again, we move it into the software, run it through an algorithm, and we get a particle size distribution at the end. And the take, uh, the, uh, one of the most important things to understand about laser diffraction instruments is that when you have a large particle in there, it's going to be generating very high intensity scattering at very low angles compared to small particles, which will generate very low intensity scattering at very high angles. When I say high angles, typically I mean anything more than about 30 degrees off axis. Uh, that's considered side angle scattering all the way back to the LA950 collects information at 166 degrees. And the wider you get, the more interesting information you get about small particles, just as the uh, more detectors you have at low angles, the better you're able to differentiate between a 2.7 millimeter particle and a 2.71 millimeter particle. So again, let me switch back to the 950 software to show you how we would use the intensity graph. And for this, I'm going to switch to different uh, measurement results. So in this case, let's say that these two are the same material. And what we really want for this material is to get a distribution graph like the black one here. This is passing. But for some reason or another, we have a result that gives us the blue result where it has far too many large particles there. So we could look at the intensity graph. And it's going to show us again what the scattering looks like. So, you know, probably the first check you should do if you have an optical microscope in your lab is just pop the sample, the, the offending sample here, so in this case the, the blue result, pop that under the microscope and just check real quick, do you have very large particles there? Uh, if you don't have a microscope, and you don't have access to a microscope. And the intensity graph will, will serve as, as another kind of sanity check. So again, what we're seeing here is uh, intensity of scatter over various angles. So as the detector number here, as the channel number gets smaller, these are lower angles. So we would expect to see very large particles scattering at the lower angle detectors. So for our good result, we see exactly which detectors are being used. For the bad result, and here I think I need to switch back to the PowerPoint, for the bad result, we would get an intensity graph maybe that looks like this, where you have much greater scattering at these lower angles. Uh, and so that's, that's, again, an indicator that it's not a problem necessarily with your refractive index choice. Uh, it's actual scattering that's being recorded in the instrument. Now, it could be coming from any number of sources. It could be actually particles. It could be coming from, you know, it could be that they're uh, 
there's a thumbprint on the measurement cell, and the thumbprint, the the ridges of the the oil that the ridges in your finger leave behind uh, are going to be a few millimeters across, so it could be being reported as very large particles. Uh, it could be some contamination that was left over from the last few samples that were run. It could be coming from any number of sources, but this is, again, just it's a sanity check. It's telling you, no, there actually is scattering on these low-angle detectors, which is why we're seeing the large particles show up. If we saw that large result and we didn't see any of these low-angle scattering, uh, detections, then there's something else going on. Then you probably want to call Hariba and ask us to take a look at your data because it could be that um, you're having a problem with the software. It could be that there's something else going on with the hardware. So again, if we overlay the intensity graphs, this is probably the clearest way to look at it. So this is the intensity graph for the not passing material with all the large particles and the intensity graph for the passing material with, all this, uh, with none of the large particles. And again, if you, if you stack them on top of each other, you very quickly see that there's a lot more scattering for this, the low angle large particle detectors uh, than in the passing results. There's also more scattering at the high angle small particles, uh, which could be coming from a few different sources as well, but because it's not showing up in the distribution, we're not, uh, we're not too concerned about it. So the intensity graph really warrants much more of an explanation than that, but I'm trying to keep this webinar fairly brief. Uh, if you would like more information about how that works, please, again, feel free to contact us. So the blank check. The blank check is another useful function in the 950 software. And this is useful in cases where, um, you know, you, you, if you're not the operator, that generated the result, and it's an off result, and the, the person who did generate it uh, doesn't have a good idea as to why it might not be passing. Maybe you, you check the microscope, you're not seeing any evidence under the microscope while you're getting the, the funky result, or you've checked with your engineering guys, your process guys, and they're saying that everything's running fine over there. Then you could look at the blank check, and what the blank check does is it's giving you an indication of the, the state of the measurement cell before sample was added. So remember the general measurement flow is that you add liquid to the analyzer, or if you're doing a dry measurement, you would turn the, the vacuum and the compressed air on. You basically get it in a state right before you would add the sample, and then you take the blank. You would, and that aligns the laser automatically. You take the blank, and that's just the background. Right? It's saying, all right, here's all the scattered light that I'm collecting on, on the 87 detectors that is not coming from my sample of interest. So please remove that from the calculation. The problem comes when you have so much background scatter that you, you might not have enough actual scattering from your sample to get above that noise threshold, that noise threshold which is now higher because maybe the system is, is dirty or you have that thumbprint on there or whatever the case may be. So the blank check is good. As a, uh, as a validating tool. So after you've gotten the measurement results, you go back, you get the blank check from the advanced function menu, and it's just going to tell you real quickly, you know, is my baseline, my blank baseline, is that good or bad? Now, what's interesting and what's important to know when you use the blank check is that you have to set up some standard for comparison. So the 950 software comes built in with a uh, a standard blank file, and that blank file was acquired, I think, in 2007, and it was not acquired on your LA950. That's just part of the standard 950 software package. So if you want to use this function, what you need to do is you need to grab any result, any measurement file you've already acquired that you feel very confident the system was clean, or you need to clean the system, take a new measurement, and then come down here and click this set standard blank button. And all this is going to do is it's going to pop open a window where it's going to ask you to load uh, the file, the NGB measurement file that you have a good feeling about, that you know the system was clean. And then that's just going to reset all the information up here, reset the comparison. And then if you, uh, if you still get the not passing result, even after you've updated the standard, then you should take a look, you know, how bad is it really? You know, if it's just barely above the baseline, that's probably okay. You want to look for long-term drift there. 
uh, if it's significantly higher, and in the 950s case, you know, this could be significantly higher, then you'd want to look at the quality of the cell. You know, has the cell been scratched? Is it, uh, is it just a cleaning issue where you, you, know, you just need to take some, some soap and water to it? Uh, so the blank check is, is a useful tool. It can only be used after you've collected the measurement, uh, and it needs an updated standard for comparison. So let me switch back to the PowerPoint. All right, custom calculations. So this was a feature that was added, I believe, also in version 6 of the software. And it's very easy to understand. So you can let me get my pointing tool back. You can, in the condition file, under the calculation tab, set up to four unique formulas where if you have a, a particular calculation that you use as a quality indicator in, in your group, uh, you can create it. So you can put the formula in here, and then as long as you identify what Z, Y, and X are here, if it's D90, D10, median, whatever, uh, give it a title, click OK, and then that will show up in your results. So we put this into place because we encountered enough customers who you know, had a very particular span calculation, let's say, where it was D86 less D14 divided by the D50, or they had something related to uh, the R parameter that they developed internally. Uh, it's just a nice way of creating custom formulas, custom results. So very easy to use. Uh, it's limited in that you, the LA950 needs to be collecting information on whatever it is you define to be Z, Y, and X. So if it's um, you know, shape factor or something that the 950 doesn't calculate, then you'll never be able to, to choose that from these drop-down lists. All right, so now we'll talk briefly about two data verification tools. So we talk a lot in our training courses and in our webinars about coefficient of variation. And coefficient of variation is just an easy way of indicating the precision of multiple measurements. So if you take three measurements in a row, the coefficient of variation takes the standard deviation of, let's say, the, the median, the D50, of those three measurements in a row, and divides it by the average of those three D50 readings. Multiplies about, excuse me, 100 to get a percentage, and displays it. And ideally, we want the coefficient of variation to be as low as possible. You know, if you have a 0.1% you know, COV value, then you have ultra-precise measurements. Uh, and in fact, we have guidance about COV values uh, it's also called Relative Standard Deviation, RSD. We get guidance from ISO 13320 and USP 429 and the uh, corresponding JP and EP uh, that we should monitor COV and make sure that our method is good enough or the system we're using is good enough uh, by monitoring COV and making sure that it's less than some critical value. So the way we would do this in the 950 software, so let me switch back. The way we would do this is um, we would display our file list utility. So this is our database tool in the 950. This is where all the measurements we've taken get displayed. We'd go to the Summary button, click Edit Layout, and then we just want to make sure that DV1, DV5, and DV9 are being displayed in the list. So by clicking the Edit Layout button up here, we're able to change what information is displayed on the summary report. We just want to make sure DV1, DV5, and DV9 are, are displayed. That's what the, uh, the COV is calculated on. Then we can choose to show the averages. We could choose to show the summary standard deviation. Uh, and then we could also choose to compare it to some standard, like ISO, USB 429, some custom standard that we came up with, or nothing at all. So in this case, we could compare it to our own internal quality standards. We click OK. And uh, now if all we were interested in were uh, three measurements in a row. So this summary report is showing us, let's say, all the measurements we took today or over the last week. But we only want to see three. What we would need to do is highlight the ones we don't want to see. So just click and drag, and then click Hide Selected. And the COV now gets recalculated. Uh, to show information, the, the averages and the standard deviation information, only for those files which are displayed. So in this case, it's not, not great. This last measurement here throws everything out of whack. 
So the COV values are incredibly high. 47% is, is very bad. Uh, if we were to hide that last offending one, then we would see that uh, for our custom metric of 20 and 15 and 20%, we're passing on the D10 and D50, but we're failing on the D90. So that's how you'd set it up. And from here, you could print the summary. You could do a screenshot of it. You could export it. Just different ways of getting the information out of the 950 software. So that's very nice. It's a very nice tool. It's very easy to see, too, when uh, you've got enough good measurements in a row that you can kind of stop for the day. There's also a function called result verification. So where this is interesting is if you have an internal specification. So this we would find in the condition files. So I'll recalculate the condition file for this. So I'd go to my verification area down here and click setting. And if I had a passing specification, I could say, all right, my passing specification is on the median size. And it's defined by me, and it should be 10 microns. And it could be 10 microns plus or minus a half micron. And, uh, you know, I could even say I want that to be within 3%. You know, I, I acknowledge that there's a 3% instrument tolerance, that the, the measurement may only be accurate within a certain percentage. And all I want it to do then is, is tell me visually if it's a passing result or if it's a failing result and display some text along with it. So I say good, bad. So set it up, recalculate. And then I just need to double click on this area here. So all the uh, all these panes in the result view, they can all be edited as to what information is displayed by double left clicking. So I'll go up here and go to verification, click OK. We see that in this case it's bad and it's off by quite a bit. So off of my 10 micron spec, again this is the black result, so I actually have a 24 micron almost, 24 micron median, so it's way off. But uh, the nice part here is you just get a nice visual, quick indicator if your result is passing or failing. Uh, and that's, that's it for today. So there's a lot more tools we could talk about in the 950. There's all sorts of different ways of using the file list database. There's all sorts of different ways we could structure the export. Uh, but those are more common functions. Those are more things that, uh, that people will know more about. Uh, the point of the webinar today was to talk about tools that probably are a little bit lesser well-known or lesser uh, not used nearly so often or maybe a little bit more complex to use and cover those. So uh, I'll stop the presentation. I'll take a quick breath and a quick drink of water, and Jeff can tell us if there are any questions that came in. Should I tell you before or after you have your drink of water? Uh, concurrently. Okay. Uh, yes, there are questions. Um, yeah, so let's see. I'll, I'll, Robin, Robin, way in the beginning, asked, uh, why isn't uh, the sky violet? And I, I, I um, yeah, and, and at that brightness, luminosity, we just can't see violet all that well. Um, so that was, that was the probably the least relevant uh, question. Um, yeah, so but the most fun for parties. Absolutely. Uh, I don't get and I, and I any party anymore. So we seem to have trouble explaining. <laughs> Probably because we talk about too many particle things. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, earlier on, you talked about uh, shearing uh, emulsions and 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 the mixers. Uh, and so, how long to? Um, would you expect to shear and mix your sample? Um, and, and this is going back to method expert and trying different di um, different circulation speeds, which changes the shear rate. Um, and how much variation would you choose? Well, I can give you my personal experience. Uh, the uh, the very worst demo I was ever a part of. Uh, it was bad because of a. Um, a mistake that I made. So we were working with a mattress company <clears throat> that had uh, developed a latex and they wanted, it was basically, it was a material that they wanted to to extrude into a, a memory foam type material, right, for those memory foam mattresses. 
and it was um, it was a rookie mistake on my part. I should have asked how to how to dilute the material. You know, what was the uh, the environment I needed to dilute into? Instead, I just added it to the LA 950, feeling very sure of myself, and I just crashed the emulsion right out. And what happened was it ended up looking like bubble gum. You know how bubble gum gets very stringy and it had wrapped all the way around the circulation pump shaft and cleaning that was just, it was a bad, bad day. Uh, so that's, you know, in that case, that, that crashed out of solution in about a second. Uh, so any pump speed for that sample was too much and, and it was, it was crashing out probably a little bit because of dilution, but as I talked to the, uh, the, the PhD researcher afterwards, it was probably because it was being sheared to death. Um, so how long is too long? It, it varies by sample. You'll know that it's happening, uh, if unless it's you know the extreme case that I just described, you'll know that it's happening because the particle size will start getting larger and it will continue to get larger. So if you see that happening and you have an emulsion, it could be because of shear, it could be because uh, you've, you've shocked it in other ways. Uh, but in that case, you could try slowing it down. We did end up selling an analyzer. We did end up selling, uh, I believe, an LA950 uh, to that, uh, that latex researcher. And the solution we gave was to use the fraction cell. And the fraction cell is just this cuvette accessory that it doesn't really have a pumping system. It, and uh, for this latex material, it was, it was small enough that it didn't need pumping. It was below one micron. Uh, the only reason we started off with the pumping system is because it's a little bit more automated and easier to use. But the fraction cell could be a, a good option if you're worried about shear. It's a very long answer for a small question. I'll try to rein it in. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Now, when you add when you add the imaginary RI, is the intensity changed? Uh, no, no, the, the measured intensity is not changed. That's, that's absolute. That's just whatever the instrument collects. The imaginary, I, the imaginary refractive index, we're trying to choose to model what's actually going on in the measurement cell. So if you have an opaque material that is scattering less light because it's uh, absorbing some amount of the incident light, uh, choosing a different imaginary RI is not going to affect the measured light scatter. It's just going to try and better fit the measured light scatter. Okay. Okay. Uh, what is the resolution? Is there any, an interaction between the two particles when I mix them? And mm, I could think of about six different ways of approaching that question. <laughs> yeah, we have to go back and define resolution. <laughs> Yeah, so probably the most common resolution question we get with uh, with any particle size analyzer is how can I resolve two different particles that are closely sized? So if I have a one micron particle and a two micron particle, can your technique uh, get baseline resolution? So in general, laser diffraction has a resolution of about three to one, sometimes two to one. So we'd be able to tell the difference of a 2 micron and a 4 micron particle or a 100 micron and a 200 micron. That changes depending on the size range. It changes depending on the uh, width of the distribution of those two different particle sizes. Obviously, if there's significant overlap between the two of them, then it becomes much harder to get uh, resolution because the scattered light pattern looks like more of a uh, uh, mix of the two of them. Uh, there's there's different things we can do to, I guess, artificially improve resolution. So we can increase the number of times the scattering pattern runs through the algorithm. We call that the iteration number. By bumping that up, it effectively narrows the distributions, the multimodal distributions, and separates them. Uh, it, it is entirely artificial, however. That's just a, it's, it's all math. Um, and we would never want to do that if we didn't have good backup information that these really were very narrow uh, size distributions and they, they truly were one and two micron. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I'm looking at the intensity graph. It only goes from 65 to 80. What does this mean? And so what this person is referring to is the intensity graph 
um, in the LA950 software. So let's say that you're talking about the x-axis, which is the detector axis. Uh, Right-click on the graph, or uh, uh, naturally, my laptop is, is not playing nice. And the Q&A session may end early when my laptop dies. <laughs> I don't have my power <laughs> cord. But uh, what you do is you'd right-click, and just to double-check, so if it is the x-axis you're talking about, right-click on it and go to setting or graph setting, and just make sure that the scale is set from 1 to 87 or 1 to 78 if you're doing the dry measurement. Uh, it could be that someone has uh, set the scale to only display values between 65 and 80. If the analyzer itself, if, if you get to see the full scale but it's only showing you information over a range of the detectors like you're seeing on my screen now, then what it's showing you is the, the most interesting information. So this is where 99.9% you know, .9 of all the useful scattering information exists are on these detectors. Uh, and that's an evaluation that the 950 software uh, will make. Okay. Where can we set up the acceptance criteria? So don't, don't oh. Ah, okay. I'll go back. Go back. I was, I was trying to sneak that in before you close the software. So the acceptance criteria, is that for a COV or for the pass-fail criteria? Um, it's not clear. Let's say... I'll, sh I'll show both. Uh, yes. So if we wanted to do this and verification thing, uh, we'd go to the advanced area, calculation, and if we're setting up conditions for a new measurement or if we're recalculating existing conditions, either way it's in the calculation tab. Go to this verification area in the bottom left. We can do a handful of different verifications. And then we click Setting and define it from there. If we wanted to do the other one, we'd go to the File List Utility, which you can always get to from this menu up here, File List Utility, Open List View. Uh, some 950 software setups have this as a tab over here on the left side, instead of the overlay memory tab, they have something called file list. It works the same way. You'd go to summary, then edit layout, and this is all in the slides. Uh, so all you need to do is download the slides, I have different screenshots of all this, and then set it up from here. Okay, um, let me jump down. Uh, when you change when you change that graph, uh, what what is different when you ask to see all the channels in, in the uh, intensity graph? What is different? Is this relating to the the scale question? Yes, yes, and I, and I, yes. So there's there's two things here. So we can either you either need to make sure that you're displaying all the information from all 87 detectors, which really has to do with how much of the, I'm, I'm pointing at my screen as if you all can see me pointing at my screen. <laughs> uh, let me get my, my pointing tool back. So it's possible that the person who asked the question is only able to see 40 to 87, or what was it, 65 to 80, 65 to 80. So that could be the entire range that they see here, in which case that's just a setup problem. Uh, otherwise, there is an option to to show all data. I need to get out of the pen tool. Uh, and you see this option called Use Channel All Channel. Uh, just click that and now you'll see the scattering information for all the other channels. And so that's, that's marginally useful. Um, again, the 950 software has already made the evaluation that these are the channels we should be looking at. Uh, this is, these are the, I shouldn't say channels, these are the detectors that have the useful information on them. Uh, looking at all of the detector responses, you know, you're going to see that some of the detectors are getting very little light scattering, which makes sense, especially at the, uh, the smaller angles where the pattern gets to be uh, very particular. But it's marginally useful. It's, uh, uh, you know, we only turn to that internally when we've probably gone through three or four different levels of troubleshooting. Okay, uh, so let me change topics a bit. Uh, when you have a cream or a gel, uh, how do you prep a sample to ensure that there is no multiple scattering? 
Oh, excellent question. Um, hmm. I know. <laughs> I know of at least three customers that would have excellent answers to that. So we actually have an accessory for the LA950 called the Pace Cell. And the Pace Cell is, is what we prefer to use when we have gels particular, in particular, because um, most people, am I, am I going off base with the, my answer here? No, no, I think this is, I, I think this is answering the question. So that's more of a sample prep question than anything software related, right? So the sample, yeah. the sample prep que uh, kind of, the interesting thing about sample prep for gels is that when you start to smear them out, uh, you could get little pockets of air that get entrained depending on the viscosity and the surface tension and da 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 da, da. So you need to be very particular about how you prepare the sample. Uh, most people that are measuring or producing gels, rather, they don't like to dilute it because that's obviously not going to make it a gel, so the particle size in the gel form may be compromised when you dilute. So we developed this accessory called the paste cell, and all, you know, the easy way to think about it is it's two pieces of optical grade glass. You put a little dollop of gel in the center, smush them together so that it becomes a nice, ideally thin, evenly, uh, uh, even thickness layer. Put it in the pay cell holder, put it inside the 950, and you generate your scattering. Uh, how do you ensure that it's of even thickness? We have micrometers at different corners, and you want to make sure that the micrometers are all basically reading the same. Uh, and that's really pragmatically how you do it. Um, and, you know, the, the person who asked the question quite rightly brings up a concern with multiple scattering. So if you have a very thick, highly concentrated gel layer, uh, chances are very, very good that you're going to be multiple scattering. So you just want that layer to get as thin as possible. That's uh, that's a you know that's that's a question that doesn't give doesn't allow very satisfying answers over the internet. Uh, if you have a sample like that, uh, go ahead and send it in. We can help you develop the method for it. You know, we have more experience with the pay cell than than um, you know the, the handful of users out there. Yeah. Okay. Um, what software? You know, what what does you do if they have data files? And they brought the data files with them, but not the instrument. Um, so how can they look at them with the software, say, at their desk looking at data files over the network? Uh, you can install an infinite number of LA950 software copies. Uh, we do not license the software. We give it away for free. That is, um, as far as I know, that's unique now. There used to be one other company that, that manufactured diffraction instruments that that would post their software free of charge. It's no longer free. Uh, so you could, that's how I would do it. And that's how we do it here in, uh, in all of our applications labs and all of our service offices. We have all of our employees install the LNN50 software. And then importing it into the software is very easy. You, uh, you just need to make sure that you have the NGB measurement files on your hard drive, on the local hard drive. The easiest way to do it is just to go to File, Open, choose the NGB file that will load it into the uh, the overlay memory or if you wanted to access some of the database functions in the file list you'd go to file list utility import and here we would just choose which folder the, the NGB file was in and then uh, import it into the, the database okay and that's a you know it's always more fun to, to do this stuff at your desk than it is sitting on a uncomfortable lab stool in the lab. Yeah, I gotta try and sneak in one more be before your battery dies. Um, and that, uh, if you take the same material and disperse it in different liquids, say hexane or acetone, um, and you use the correct RI values, presumably for both the liquid and the particle, are your results typically this comparable? They should be. Um, they should absolutely be comparable. It depends on, you know, everyone's internal kind of value for what comparable means. Um, I would certainly expect the results to be within a few percentage points of each other, uh, so long as you are using the correct refractive index, a and so long as the different dispersants aren't having any, uh, they're not changing the the nature of the particle itself, or they're not changing the interaction of the particle. So if 
if dispersing in heptane, let's say, lowers the, um, you know, the, the potential gap between the particles and now they're more likely to aggregate, then you may obviously get a different result. Uh, but in a well-dispersed sense with correct refractive indices, you should get very, very close values. You may not get identical values, but you may get very close values. Yeah. yeah. So I guess the classic thought experiment would be uh, salt, sodium chloride, in water or hexane. You should get pretty different results there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, a little, little <laughs> salt gets a little bit smaller in water. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Okay, well, I think that about covers everything we have time for. So, Ian, I'd like to thank you very much and for, for the presentation, and we look forward to seeing all of you at the next webinar. Okay, bye for yeah. now. Thanks, everyone. Bye.